I, I read something a long time ago that people don't work for a company. They work for their, their supervisor. They work for a person. And so if you're not invested in them, if they don't think you care about them, if they don't think you care about their ideas, they're only going to just clock in and clock out. But if they know you care, they're going to give you their ideas. They're going to give you their innovations. They're going to give you their insight. And that's where our best ideas have ever come from. It doesn't come from me. If, if all the ideas are coming from me, we're in trouble. The ideas are coming from the people who do it every day, who deal with the frustrations, who deal with the clients who are unhappy because something's not working. And so if you invest in your people, if you take time for them, if you're intentional, again, using that word, they're going to they're gonna make your product better. They're going to fine-tune your processes for you, and it all falls in line. We would like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. B1 Bank knows that entrepreneurs like you are always thinking one step ahead. So you need banking solutions that can keep up. It begins with lending. Does your business need working capital or financing for new equipment? How about a real estate or a construction loan? Good news. The B1 Lending Team is ready to learn your goals and help you find the best lending option available. Now let's talk about uncomplicating your daily cash flow. B1 offers a full array of treasury management services that let you collect funds faster, pay funds more efficiently, and access your information with powerful online tools. Most importantly, B1 understands the value of working with local nonprofits to build a stronger community. They believe in giving back through hands-on involvement with their B1 community outreach program because it's simply the right thing to do. B1 Bank. Be uncomplicated. To learn more, visit B1Bank.com. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Hello, I'm Andrew McClendon, your host of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm here today with our producer, Mr. Alex White with Propel Productions. And our guest today is Mr. Jeff Harmon with CEO of Community Management. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming in. So why don't we start by you telling us uh, who community management is and what it is that you do. Sure. Um, we manage homeowners associations, to put it rather simple. Um, homeowners associations are created to oversee neighborhoods, right? Uh, when a developer creates a neighborhood, they put it in place so that when the community is growing, you have ponds, front entrances, swimming pools, clubhouses, um, making sure that those things can run so the people who live in there can enjoy them and the property values are, are protected. Um, people have to pay into the HOA so the HOA can pay those bills. Uh, and also the HOA is there to make sure that everybody takes care of their homes, um, cuts their grass, doesn't you know, park their car in their yard, things of that nature. We're hired as a third-party company to come in and manage those things. So we, we collect the dues. Um, we, we send out letters if somebody needs to correct something at their home. We work with the vendors to correct problems and so forth. And so we're hired as a, a third-party company to come in and do that for you know, single-family homeowners associations, uh, condominium associations, high-rise associations, um, uh, those type of things. So they're all designed to lay out the rules, the do's and the don'ts, mm -hmm. um, so that ultimately you're uh, maximizing property value. That's exactly right. Right. Um, so... Um, you're hired then by the board of directors from an HOA, right? Correct. So, um, what I know there's things that and, uh, that a management company will do for an HOA, but I, I suspect there's a longer list of things that you don't do. What are some of the things that you've run into that? Right. Maybe, maybe y'all. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the biggest uh, misconception is that um, somehow we're the decision makers. Uh, you know that we we decided that we didn't like the color you want to paint your house, and so community management is the one who decided you shouldn't yeah. do that. Or, um, you know, if there if it says if you don't pay your dues on time, you get a late fee. Well, community management made up that late fee, so yeah. they can pocket that. Well, we're just there to enforce the rules that were already created, and so um, I think that's a big misnomer. And so do y'all do, uh, like, multifamily? It's kind of funny you should ask that. Um, we uh, ha were approached years ago to do multifamily. Um, 
actually brought somebody in uh, from out of Texas to kind of start that division, uh, was rocking and rolling with a brand new apartment complex being built. And then the developers decided they wanted to self-manage. Um, we put a lot of time and effort in creating this new division. Uh, we were excited about it and it, it didn't work out. But we learned a lot of stuff from it. Uh, that person we brought in from Houston had a lot of corporate experience. And in that part in our company's growth, um, we didn't have things that you would think you should have at a time of that company's growth, like a, like a team member manual or any kind of those kind of things. And so this person from Houston came in and said, we got to get some things in place here. And so I always look, I look at every, um, everything that doesn't work out in life. There's positives that come from it. Right, and right. the positive that came from that was, is, yeah, we didn't get the multifamily division like we wanted uh, managing apartment complexes but we got so much more in the terms of structure that we needed to be able to build upon so long story is that we don't do apartment complexes yeah. now. Well, so is it something you would continue to uh, pursue oh yeah we're always open to adding new things um we started out as a, an eight you know we want to manage hoas but now we have a, a, a single family property management division that manages individual rentals for investors i see and we also have a maintenance division now because uh, there was so much of a need. So always looking for ways to to build kind of that vertical relationships, things that have good synergy with what we do, which is to manage. So in multifamily, um, they're not the, the, the uh, apartment dwellers. They're not owners. Correct. But it's a diff- It's different in that you would just be. Man, how how is that different? Well, what we found was is that uh, there was a lot of differences in that. Um, you know. When, you, when you're managing HOAs, every single homeowner, um, that's their home. They, they own it. They, they take a lot of stock into it. When we went to the multifamily realm and really learned about that, it was, it was more of, you know, you were, I was almost liken it to like I would think of a hotel. Uh, I thought they were very similar, managing HOAs and managing uh, multifamily apartment complexes, but I learned very quickly it was just too many differences. You were more of a, um, a service resort kind of feel management to it than a overseeing this this entity of paying dues and, and cutting your yard, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, how many HOAs and communities uh, is community management uh, handling today? Sure. We're, we're knocking on about 275. Um, wow. Yeah, we're very blessed. I mean, um, never in a million years would I have told you we would be where we're at today. Um, if you'd have asked me 15 years ago, uh, you know, we're in, we're in three different states, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, we, we manage close to right now, I want to say 35,000 individual homes, um, that are part of our HOAs. Uh, if they all were built out, it would be closer to 55,000. And, um, you know, when myself and my friends who started the company first got started, we thought if we got to like 30 communities, we'd be on the beach sipping drinks and just enjoying all this mailbox money, right. That you hear about as a young person, a young entrepreneur, um, what it's grown to today is, is quite remarkable. Yeah. So, I mean, you're very much an operating company. Yes. Right. And how many employees do you have? We're knocking on 70. Wow. Um, so of those, how many uh, are in the office and how many are in the field? Do you have any that are on properties? Um, we have three that are on, well, we have five employees total that are on properties. We manage a couple of high rise condos, um, that they want to have an on site manager. Um, and so we do have some that work there, but of the 70 employees, we have probably three that work at our main office. Um, it's a funny story. Uh, it's a long story, but, um, we recently bought that building a couple of years ago. Um, and so that we could expand in that building. Uh, but then we, when, when COVID hit, we had to quickly pivot to putting everybody remote. At the time, we only had certain people that remote. I mean, we're in different cities, right? We're in Shreveport, Lafayette, Lake Charles, Mobile, um, Biloxi. So we had to have managers in those areas. And so we always let them work remote, you know, work from home. Uh, it was kind of a perk. Um, but when COVID came and nobody could be in the office, we had to pivot to that. So now we have found that actually letting people work remote, we get more efficiency out of them. Um, and we were, again, learning off of kind of mistakes or disasters. You know, we flooded in 2016. Our building did. took on two and a half feet of water. Um, and so we were forced to be able to quickly think on the fly, how do we, how do we keep operations going? How, you know, because these HOAs, especially the ones that flooded, needed our help. Yeah. And so we 
basically let everybody work from home for that period until we could find a temporary office. And that setback, which was a big setback, basically set us up to when COVID, COVID happened, we didn't miss a beat. I mean, we That's didn't miss a beat. So how many were in the office before the flood of 2016? Before the flood, at that point, um, I would say 80% of our workforce was in the office. Wow. So at that time, it was probably 35, 40 people. No kidding. Mm-hmm. And now we have three. No kidding. So, so working remote is working that well for you. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing. We're a big believer, a big philosophy at our company is, is that we don't want to be um, the creators of technology, we just want to be the ones who leverage technology the best. Um, and so we're always looking to leverage technology. That's a big push for us. Um, sometimes I tell, uh, you know, my supervisors, my leaders that I want to be known as a communications and technology company that just so happens to manage HOAs. Oh, wow. um, and so technology has always been a big thing. I'm not a technology guru. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that if you're the smartest person in the room about everything, then you're in trouble. Um, I'm a big believer in that. So one of my um, partners at the time when the company started, he did a lot of research into technology and he was very good about it, understanding how to leverage it and put it together. And so finding out what management software we needed to use, um, what software we needed to use internally and within the office. And then as years have gone on, I've just leveraged uh, people who know technology say, look, my goal is, is I want to be able to manage anywhere in the world. Okay. I, it's one of the things that I've always told people who've asked me about growing a business is grow it with the mindset of being scalable. Put everything in place that you can scale it. Um, Because if you do that, um, I've I've told my team now, I mean, if we can manage in Lafayette, I can manage in Tokyo. I mean, what's the difference? Time zone, that's it. And so we've put a lot of effort and money and time into creating technology that is efficient for my team. Because if your team is efficient, then they're productive. Um, But also makes it easy for them to work anywhere they need to work. Because, uh, for instance... I have a, a young lady who is an amazing team member of ours who is her, her family's moving back to Kansas where she's from. And of course she was worried. She was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I love this company. I'm like, you have Wi-Fi up in Kansas. She was like, yeah. I'm like, well, you're not leaving us then. <laughs> and that's what it's allowed us to do. Wow. And it's allowed us to open up the talent pool to anywhere in the, anywhere in the world. You know, before technology and leveraging it, you were, you were stuck to only finding the best people in this geographic scope. Well, now, I mean, with, with all the technology that allows us to do, I can hire anybody anywhere for that position. So it's been a really cool thing. So um, you had 35 or 40 people in the office pre-flood. You had technology in place. Mm-hmm. Um, then your, your office was, was damaged. Right. And, and so you were able to uh, stay engaged and, and do your work, right? That's right. We had to put some things in place um, that people knew, you know, uh, th- there's some really good software out there that allows you to track what the person's screen is at any given time and, and how much time they've been on their screen and so forth. So, you know, we have accountability measures um, to be sure to put on those kind of devices to make sure that, you know, they're, they're working. But what we found is, and when that happened with the flood is the first kind of glimpse we got, people are just so more efficient when they're not having to worry about what they're going to, you know, drive and sit in traffic all morning they're in a bad mood because they're you know they were stuck in traffic they're not worried about leaving the office early because they don't want to sit in traffic on the way home um you know you you cut back on a lot of that water cooler talk and interruptions where people step in the office and want to ask you one thing and it turns into a 15 minute conversation about you know game of thrones or something and so we eliminated a lot of that and we saw efficiency go up i mean tremendously um and and quite frankly the biggest challenge the biggest challenge to that was, was staying intentional in our relationships. So making sure that, hey, supervisors, you have to get on a, uh, we, we use Teams, but a Zoom for most people that think of, you know, virtual meetings. Right, right. They have to get on there and talk with their teams every week. You have to see their face and engage with them um, because that is the biggest danger of a remote workforce is they start to feel like they're on an island by themselves right. and they no longer feel part of the team. Right. So you have to be intentional about that if you're going to create this remote workforce. Yeah, because there's people that have, have had good experiences, like it seems like you've had, and, and others that haven't, mm-hmm. where things do begin to fall apart and employees do begin to feel disconnected and, and then they end up moving on. Um, so, but it seems like what you're saying is you've been successful with it because you did what it takes 
what it took to remain engaged with them. Yeah, it's it, it's critical. And and um, the the what one thing that I think COVID has done, and you will continue to see the the, the remnants of it, is people liked working from home. I know there's some that like going to an office, but it forced people to work from home these past 18 months, 12 months. People are going to look for that. I mean, so many people that, that work for us, that's a perk to them. I mean, not having to uh, get up and fight the traffic and get to work in your own space. Um, but at the same time, you have to put in measures that you're being more intentional than what you would be if you didn't have a remote workforce. Right. You know, if you don't have a remote workforce, you're just walking through the halls. You're going to see Joe or, or Sue and talk with them and how, how was your weekend, hear about their kid's graduation. You do lose that when you become a remote workforce. And so you have to make sure you're being intentional. We use the word a lot, in, the word intentional a lot in our company. Yeah. Um, we're going to be intentional in making sure that you know you're being heard that your supervisor is working with you and talking with you, checking in on you, not just from a business point of view, but from a, you know, a person point of view. And so that's critical. If you're, if you're thinking about going to a remote workforce, you have to think about how am I going to be intentional to stay close and connected with each of these team members? Yeah, I'm going to get off script here because I was going to ask you about this later, but it seems like a good point to inject it here. It's, it's your management style. Mm -hmm. So it seems uh, that you're really in tune you know, with that, uh, being intentional and mm -hmm. can you give us some insight uh, on how you would define your management style and where you think that came from and what you do uh, in bringing in content you know whether it's reading you know business books or sure whatever. sure so uh, our biggest thing is is that we you know we uh, I'm a big believer there's three p's in business right there's the product the process and the people um very early on in my years of starting a business, I was focused on the product and the process. I thought if I could offer the best service and put the best processes in place to deliver that service, then the people, I could just plug them in. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. Completely, uh, just, it was terrible. It was a bad mistake. And we, we were blessed and we did well. Um, but it's once I, I turned that around and said, focus on the people. Put people before processes and products. Um, Make sure you're hiring the right people. Make sure you're setting a culture for them to follow. Um, you know, it took us years for me to actually put a cultural statement together because I thought people just, you know, they were going to just get it. Um, and so my management style is very much take care of your people. Focus on your people. Um, make sure that they have a purpose. See, so many times you just give people a job duty and say this is your job duty. Well, people are going to work for a job duty so much, but if you give them a purpose – if you say the reason you're so important to this company is because this is your purpose, and I tell people all the time, do the, uh, do the Scrooge thing with them. Say, let's remove you from the equation. Let's take you out and then see what happens to our processes. And they go, oh, well, it would break down. Exactly. That's why you're important. That's your purpose here. And so my, my style is, is when I work with my supervisors, we meet every week, and I meet with each of my supervisors one-on-one -on -one every week because I want to show them that, we have to invest in people. Um, I, I read something a long time ago that people don't work for a company. They work for their, their supervisor. They work for a person. And so if you're not invested in them, if they don't think you care about them, if they don't think you care about their ideas, they're only going to just clock in and clock out. But if they know you care, they're going to give you their ideas. They're going to give you their innovations. They're going to give you their insight. And that's where our best ideas have ever come from. It doesn't come from me. If, if all the ideas are coming from me, we're in trouble. The ideas are coming from the people who do it every day, who deal with the frustrations, who deal with the clients who are unhappy because something's not working. And so if you invest in your people, if you take time for them, if you're intentional, again, using that word, they're going to they're gonna make your product better. They're going to fine-tune your processes for you, and it all falls in line. So is that just uh, – th that's great stuff. I'm just curious, did you just uh, develop that over – time or did you learn that from a previous uh mentor or did you uh, sure I read um, and pick up on that i mean that's good stuff lots of failure um and, and what i mean by that is is that we again i was i'm i'm, a, I'm very much a numbers guy that's kind of what i brought to the table when we started this company and, and and understanding and processes right i'm a process guy and so i thought again you know come up with this great idea, you know, manage a better way and, and put processes behind the scenes and, and we'd just be able to plug anybody in. And then I just came to find that, I mean, I was, you know, we weren't having the right people. We were having a lot of turnover. Um, our, our clients were unhappy. Um, 
I'm, I'm terrible at hiring people. I'm, I've, I learned that very early on. I don't, I don't hire people well for some reason. And so finding, <laughs> finding, finding the team members who are better at reading people and understanding people. And it's just the more that I started focusing on our people and, and understanding, okay, you know, somebody told me a long time ago, um, cheap people are expensive and expensive people are cheap. Meaning that, you know, I was trying to hire at the lowest common dollar that I could and finding a lot of turnover, and it wasn't really, it was more headaches. When I started raising that bar some and getting good, high-quality people in there, all of a sudden, we're growing exponentially because those people are actually fine-tuning my product and my processes for me. So I said, wait a second, dummy. Stop, stop focusing all your effort on the product and the processes. Focus on the people, and then they will do that for you, and they'll do it much better than you because, again, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room about everything. If, I, if I'm the smartest person in the room about how to do accounts payable, how to do accounts receivable, how to go do site visits, then we're in trouble, right? I mean, why do I have all you here? So I surround myself with people who are talented, who care, who, who are invested in the company because they know I care about them. Well, it all works out. Good stuff. All right, let's take a quick break, get in word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Okay. One of our sponsors, MBD Maintenance, is excited to announce that after 25 years, they're rebranding their company name to Pivotal. It's the same ownership, same staff, same location. Just a new name that better represents the services that they provide their clients across the Southeast United States. Pivotal does commercial building, construction, and renovation. They do tenant improvement work in retail and office facilities. They do installation of dock doors and distribution centers, storm and fire damage repair, and catastrophe recovery for national disasters. The team at Pivotal is simply the best. Their experience, they crush schedules, and they have an impeccable safety record. If Pivotal can help you with your next project, you can find them online at PivotalPerforms.com. And we are back with Jeff Harmon, uh, CEO with Community Management. So, Jeff, why don't we dial it back a little bit and talk about how you got in business. But, but even before that, I was curious. You're definitely an entrepreneur, and uh, that reads through. But were you entrepreneurial as a kid? Yeah, um, I didn't set up a lemonade stand or go cut grasses. But the biggest thing I would say from an entrepreneurial standpoint is my dad taught me the value of uh, of, of money and and using it and leveraging it to to grow and to to do better things. My dad was very much an entrepreneur. Um, he, he, he worked for companies, but he always got into positions where they kind of, he was the one to kind of help in, in, uh, invent new things for them or, or create new processes for them. And so what I enjoyed about it, um, in, in creating a business is the creation part, right? Creating something out of nothing, uh, and I, out of an idea. And so, um, from that perspective, yes. So after college, you actually, uh, started a business with your father, right? Yeah, so um, I actually was married my, my last year of college to my sweetheart today, with 20 year anniversary this year. Um, and uh, I was finishing up my undergrad degree and really didn't know what I was going to do. And my dad called and said, Hey, you know, why don't we start this? And I was like, Sure, why not? Um, and uh, we ran that business together successfully for, I think, close to 15 years. Um, and what was that? Uh, it was called Consumer Debt Counselors, it was a financial counseling company. Um, I didn't have any background in that, but I was I was good with numbers, and so uh, we'd opened offices in here in New Orleans and, and Lafayette, um, and uh, it was a great great time, great learning experience, getting to work alongside him and kind of pick his brain every day. That's great. And so, tell us then the story about how you decided to go into this next business, community management. Sure. Um, so. I have no real estate background. I have no property management background. Um, I like I was doing consumer debt counselors, and my wife and I went to a friend of ours' house one night. We were going to go on a date uh, with with him and his wife, and um, on his on his counter in the kitchen there was a letter from his HOA. And I was like, "What the heck is an HOA? Like, what 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 exactly is this?" He said, "Oh, it's the people that tell me I got to cut my grass, and you know they make sure the fountains running at the front entrance." Um, I said, "Well, you know who who sent you this letter?" He said, "Oh, well, a couple of residents who volunteer on the board." And I, I looked at him and I was like, well, you couldn't pay me to do that. <laughs> and then and then we kind of looked at each other. That went that weird moment where like the light bulb goes off. I said, wait a second. So you could pay me to do that. Um, and so really it kind of was born from that moment of 
well, do other people pay people to manage this? And, and in Louisiana, it was a very still a, in an infantile stage of HOA management. But in other parts of the country, I mean, it's been going on for years. Um, and, you know, at the time I was doing the business, my dad, uh, he, he owned a business and we had two other friends um, who were always, we talked about trying to do something together, right? Kind of a side business, right? right. Um, and so really the thought was, is that we'll create this, you know, we'll hire one or two people and we'll get 30 or 40 communities and man, we'll be raking in the dough and there'll be like, you know, the whole idea of mailbox money, right? This money that just magically appears. You don't have to do any work for as a young entrepreneur. You think that's what's going to happen, right? You're going to yeah. set something up and then forget about it. Um, and, and it just, it grew. I mean, it, it grew and it grew and it grew. And I tell people all the time and they're amazed by this is, you know, a CEO of a HOA management company of, of our size, you know, I've never managed a single HOA. I've never, never, never gone and done a site visit. I've, I've gone to a few, a, a few general meetings to talk to residents about what we do. Um, but you don't have to be an expert in something to run a business. You have to be an expert in how to run a business. It's a big difference. You know, I used to think that if you needed, if you wanted to run an auto mechanic shop, you should probably know how to work on cars. But, well, no, you just hire the best auto mechanics and come up with a better process and product and then put the right people in place. And there you go. Yeah, that's So awesome. it's, 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 I never in a million years would have ever told you that I would have been the CEO of an HOA management company when I came out of college. Yeah, that's okay. So you, you had, y'all got uh, incorporated, you created an LLC. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And with four partners? Yeah, four partners at the time. So that's a lot of mouths to feed. It was. It was. But I mean... We, but everyone's doing it part-time. Everybody was time. doing... Yeah, I mean, we, we you know, one, one of them kind of was the, the put the money in place for us, like was the, the, the financial backer. Uh, another one brought, like I told you, the, the software and the technology knowledge to it. Right. Another one brought his, his relationships in the real estate world because we had to get clients from somewhere. Um, and so in the real estate world, developers and so forth... And then I just brought with it kind of the numbers, the, the financials, I had part of it and the, the kind of the processes. Okay, so uh, you you go out and you, you begin to get some associations mm -hmm. to manage. Mm -hmm. and um, But at some point it starts to pick up some steam. So how was that trajectory your first you know, three or four years? Sure. Um, it was slow going at first uh, because we were trying to figure out our way and, and, and really kind of how to do it. Um, I, I say a lot of times in those first few years, we were working hard but not smart. Uh, we were using Excel sheets to keep up with residents, and, and we, were, we were doing things. What I, I look back now, and I kind of go, oh, my gosh, how do, we even, how do we even survive doing it that way? Um, you know, we, we, had one, we hired one person to do everything for each HOA. Like, one person did all the parts, the accounts, receivable parts, the payables parts, go and did their own site visits. And so we really started backing up and going, look, if we're going to scale this, because we really wanted to create something that was scalable, um, we, we have to work smarter, not harder. We have to use technology. We have to leverage technology. Um, and we also decided at that point that we wanted a management style for HOAs where we had different departments. So you had multiple people touching one HOA instead of one person being right. responsible for one HOA. And so we, we began to really look at software that and technology that worked well with each other so that our team didn't have to learn five different software types to run what we needed to do. And uh, so we went, you know, we went from those first four years having 20 to the next four years. At the end of those four years, we had close to probably 100. So our growth began to become exponential the more we leveraged that technology. We were able to offer better services, more efficient services, um, begin to realize, hey, you know, don't let Jeff hire people. Um, find somebody who, who does a better <laughs> job of that. And, and really putting a lot of emphasis, like I said, on the people. Um, and, and, and through those first four to eight years, kind of a mantra that's come up that my people hear me talk about all the time is, is that, you know, progress isn't pretty, but it's progress. And that's something that I preach all the time because so many times in life we want things, we want to get from point A to B with as least bumps as possible, right? We want to just... We want, to, right. we want to introduce this new technology. We want to introduce this new position. We want to hire somebody. We want to take on a new client. And we just want it to kind of go how in our minds we think it should go. But it never does. And so if you can go ahead and train your mind that progress isn't pretty, but it's progress. And that's what you want. You want progress. Then you get where you want to go a lot better. And so that, those first years taught us that because the progress we had to kind of go through to get to find out where we needed to be was hard. It, was, it wasn't pretty at all. Yeah. So at what point did you begin to say, hey, this looks like it could be a, 
uh, a real opportunity and, and turn into a full-time gig for you. Sure. Um, that definitely happened. Uh, it, you know, it, we, we kind of looked up one day and said, okay, wait a second. We're, 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 we're getting to the point now where, you know, we, we've got more team members than what I ever imagined we would have. Um, we need more office space. And kind of when we hit that 100 HOA mark, something we never thought was possible. Like it was like this albatross that was just out there. Like you're not going to, you're not going to hit a hundred. When we hit that, we kind of stepped back and said, okay, I think we might be onto something here. So let's really, <laughs> let's really talk about how we want to structure this because we don't want it to be, we don't want it to fall apart. And one of the things that we recognized at that time is that so much of what we had wanted people to do, the processes, you know, we really didn't even have them typed out. We just expected people to know what we wanted them to do. So it was really at that point that we realized, okay, if we want to be big boys here, we, we've got to lay out the foundation of what our company looks like. And then from that point, so after eight years, we were at 100. Um, you know, now at 15 years, and almost double the time, we're almost at 300. So our growth has continued to be exponential. And, yeah. and I give all the credit, first and foremost, to God. I have to say I'm a blessed man. Secondly, to the people. I'm telling you, once we realize that you put all your eggs into the people, yeah, it just it takes care of itself. Okay, so what year did you go full time? Um, I probably started doing this full time, running it as CEO, probably about three or four years ago. Um, you know, it was kind of when I had my other company, I had commitments to that company. Sure, sure. Um, so I would wake up at you know three thirty in the morning and work on community management from like four to like eight go do my other job. And then, you know, in the afternoons and the evenings. Um, and, and look, there were times I was like, this is dumb. Like this, I, this, I got, I, we, we, I got to get out of community management. This is dumb. You know, I had a young family. Um, it, but, uh, but, but I stuck with it. I stuck with it. And now, I'm, uh, you know, I am where I am today. And so I would tell any young entrepreneur, I mean, there are going to be those moments. Sure. There's going to be those times where you want to just be like, you know what, let me just go back to work for somebody else. It's so much easier that way. Um, you know, if you believe in what you're doing, stick with it. Yeah. And so uh, you started with four partners. Today you have two. There's two. two of us, yes. So talk about that process of um, how you go from four to two. Sure. Um, it was really just a natural evolution of people being in, in different places in their life. Um, and and so we had one partner who was, uh, you know, having starting out a family. Um, they had uh, kind of shifted their mindset and, and went to work somewhere else uh, for full time and didn't have as much time to devote and um, just after thought and prayer they came and said hey look I just kind of I want to pull pull back out of this um, I'm not giving it what I, I want to and, um, and, and and you know and, and needed some needed some financials at that time and so we, we, we did that and then the same thing happened with the other partner um, yeah. just stage of their life uh, he yeah. was growing another business and felt like he could use some resources to help really propel that which it has um, and so it made sense for them. I mean, in both cases, I tried talking them out of it. I'm like, guys, you know, come on, stick with me, you know, stick yeah. here. But, um, but we're still great friends today. Um, I do think that there's a way that these things can naturally evolve if, if it's meant to be where you yeah. don't have big falling out or anything of that right, nature. Right. It's not easy. No. And it was, it was but both times it was because we were friends first, um, right. very good friends. Um, and, and thank God we still are today. Um, there are moments there, uh, you know, anytime I say this, anytime money's involved, you, you always got to yep, be yep. careful. Um, but I think if, if both parties know that it's each other's best intentions at heart, um, then, then it works out. And we're just blessed with that. I mean, one of my partners, uh, who's not a partner now, sent me something this morning, an article and said, hey, I think this could really help community management. So that's, that's, yeah, the, that's what you build. Fantastic. Yeah. So you, you touched on working smarter and not harder. Yeah. And, and you, you gave us some numbers about your, your growth trajectory. Can you give us a little more insight into what that working smarter looked like? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, most businesses, their, their single biggest expense is going to be manpower, human resources, right? right. And so... What I always say is, is that if you can find computers to make jobs more efficient, not to get rid of the human element, because I think a human element is always needed, right, to make judgment calls and to be innovative, right? But if you can find technology that can help your people do their job more efficient, they're going to be able to do more of that job before you have to hire a second person. Um, they're going to be able to offer a better service, so you're going to grow quicker because of word of mouth. And so we just continue to look for technology that would make our 
our team members' lives better and easier. They're working smarter, not harder. So we have teams of people who go out in the field and, and look at every community and see, okay, you know, does anybody need to cut their grass? Uh, does anybody, you know, is there a broken pond, fountain, or whatever? Well, in the beginning, they were going out and writing it down on a paper, having to come back to the office, type it in, enter it into the software, and then the manager would see it and work it. You know, there would be time delays. It would be a waste of time. So we went and found technology that allowed them with their smartphone to go out, create it right there in the field. It uploads instantaneously. Our manager gets an alert. They can work on it right there. Those are the kind of things that allowed us to, to, to work smarter and so we can do more with that. Um, and so we continue to, it's not, always, it's not always a home run. You know, we've definitely put technology in place that after, you know, a year of using it, we're like, okay, this was a bad idea. This ain't working. And you have to be able to admit you made bad mistakes. I, I talked to my leadership team this morning about, you know, uh, moving on from bad ideas. Uh, you know, I talked about how they used to um, hunt raccoons, and I only know this from, you know, stories. They would put a shiny object in a box, and the raccoon would reach in and grab that shiny object. And when he tried to reach back out, he couldn't because his fist was bald, but he wouldn't let go of the shiny object. And so he would stay there until the hunters came. That's how they did it. And I said, we can't be a company that holds on to objects that we thought was shiny because they're not working. We got to let it go and move on to something else. And so, you know, not every idea you're going to try in a company, whether it be technology or anything, is, is going to be the right one. If you stubbornly hold on to it, well, that's to your detriment. You know, you got to learn to let go of those things. And so with the number of employees that you've grown over the years, when you make an investment in technology, that investment grows to some pretty significant numbers, I suspect. Yes. yes. So uh, and technology has been a common uh, theme in the conversation here. So it sounds like you've had to do that a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is that other than your personnel, is that technology investment one of your biggest investments? Uh, by far. By far. I mean, it, it, technology, we're always looking for technology to, to make us better. We're never satisfied with what we have. Um, e and even the technology we use, I'm constantly telling my team, how can we use it different? How, how, how can we use it in a way that even the developers of that technology never intended for it? I mean, I can promise you the, the owners of the, the management software that we use, I know sometimes they're like, oh my gosh, it's, it's community management again, telling us there's another thing, there's another way that we can use their software. But if, if, if you're not pushing the, the envelope of how to use it, then, then you're never going to get the most out of anything, right? If, you know, I tell my people all the time, you know, success and greatness is a journey. It's not a goal. Because if, if, if greatness is a goal, well, what is it? Okay, well, I want to make X amount of dollars a year. Okay, well, when you get to that, you're done. Like, you're not going to try to innovate anymore. You're not going to try to better yourself. So, so the same thing with technology. I mean, tech, having technology the way you want it is a journey. I'm never going to get to a place where I go, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's doing exactly what I envisioned it now. So we're just going to stop thinking of ways to innovate. And so greatness, technology, think of them as a journey. Yeah. You know, don't think of them as you a goal. Know, I watched a uh, webinar that um, one of your technology companies that you uh, buy software from, and they had done a case study on your company mm -hmm. uh, and, and studying. They did a really good job on this webinar. And... Um, and they study your growth that you had mentioned earlier over the years and uh, and all the different upgrades of technology that you had bought from them. Yeah. And then it wasn't always a, no. you know, a smooth process, but you guys were engaged with one another. You guys, are, as community management, are reporting to the software company, you know, what you could use, what you could need, and, and back and forth. And it seemed like a true partnership, which ultimately – has built a, a product that seems that it works well for you yeah, and uh, has made you more efficient. And uh, so I, I, I'm not so sure how, uh, uh, you know, how they feel about when the phone rings, when community management call, but I, I, I think it's probably a pretty good thing because y'all got a good thing going there. Yeah. You know, I, I say a rising tide lifts all ships. And so I tell all my vendors that, um, you know, I tell my team when they're working with our different vendors, whether it's a software vendor or any vendor, you know, I, I want to make you the best you possibly can be because you're my vendor. If you're the best you can be, I'm going to be better. So, you know, it's not all altruistic. Um, yeah. If I, if I make my software vendor better, 
then they're going to make me better. And so it's, it's, it's a win-win situation. You know, investing in people and being intentional in people is not just your own employees. It's, it's investing in the relationships you have with your vendors, especially your big ones. Um, if, if you just say, okay, well, it's your job to come up with technology for me. It's your job to, to figure it out for me. Then, then what are you doing? Like you're, you're, you're basically captive to their ideas. Right. But if you bring your ideas to them and you're constantly saying, hey, I think I can make you better this way, well, it's going to be reciprocal. You're, you're going to benefit from that. Yeah, I mean, you've got boots on the ground. You're the one in, in engaging with your customers. That's and right. Know what to, and you're hiring them to right. put the technology in place to make that run more efficient. So um, I wanted to ask you about hiring. You've, you've made a couple of comments about that, <laughs> that's something that you didn't particularly do very well, but it sounds like you guys have have developed kind of a sophisticated system of yeah. personality profiles. Or yeah. something. Tell, tell us about that. That's yeah. fascinating. So, um, you know, in the beginning, I was I was mainly doing the interviewing and hiring when we started out. Um, and, and some of the people I hired were good, you know, but overall, um, there was no rhyme or reason, right? It was just right. looking at a resume, talking about experience, meeting them across the table and talking and, okay, they, they look good. And as time went on and we continued to have turnover, turnover was a big problem. And, and, and I knew it shouldn't be, right? We're not, we're not like um, a fast food restaurant where turnover is typical. Like we, we shouldn't be having people leave every nine to 12 months and then being done with it. I mean, our, our industry is a thankless industry. It's tough, but it shouldn't be that way. And so as we continue to really focus on the people, we, okay, well, what kind of people do we want? Like what is, what is the culture going to look like here? And then how do we make sure we get those people? So, um, we looked at personality profiles, tests that you can give somebody that kind of tells you different things about their personality. And I said, well, let's give all of our current team the personality profile. Oh, wow. And we did it. And I used that as a baseline. Well, the really top notch ones that I knew I wanted forever, I was like, okay, well, this is what we're looking for. And the ones that weren't working out, I'm like, okay, well, this is what we need to watch out for. And so every time we would hire somebody, we would give them a personality profile before they got to the second interview. And it would give us some, some ideas of, of whether or not that's who we wanted. Well, then we add, then I read a book one day and I can't remember the book. I think it's the, the Brown shorts book or something, but it talked about this idea of when you ask interview questions, are you just asking random generic questions? Or are you asking questions to get real answers of what this person looks like? And so my leadership team and I went through a 12 month process of identifying what are the six, five to six characteristics of what we're looking for in a person. And then what questions can we ask them that would tell us whether or not they have this trait? And they're open-ended questions. So now we have the personality profile. We have our, what I call, we call our brown short questions. Like, do they, do they fit our mold? And, and using those two things together, I would say right now, our team is as solid as it's ever been with the most employees we've ever had. That is fascinating. That's a great job, man. Very cool. Okay, let's take another break, get in word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. We would like to thank Gear Train for their support of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. GearTrain is a national program management company that specializes in the inspection and audit of conveyor systems, VRCs, robotics, and material handling equipment. GearTrain also manages routine maintenance and repair programs, as well as emergency callouts for clients all across the United States. GearTrain technicians have the experience to keep your automated equipment systems running at peak output. For all of your inspection, audit, and maintenance needs, reach out to GearTrain. They can be found online at GearTrainPerforms.com. Okay, and we are back with Jeff Harmon with uh, Community Management. Jeff, you've talked about culture, um, and you've talked about your executive team. I, I, was, I wanted to touch first on, on the culture part because – it seems like there's been a lot of continuous change. You've talked about this endless pursuit of improvement. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in that environment, which is a, a good, healthy environment for a business, that's what you want. But it seems like maintaining culture uh, becomes more and more challenging. And then when you add the remote sure. aspect of it. So can you talk about the importance of culture in your business, and how you manage that. Sure. Um, again, going back to my first focus ever really being on the product and the process, you know, culture wasn't a big 
thing in my mind in the beginning. Um, again, I thought I could just plug anybody in, right? Plug anybody in and they just do the job and, you know, they, they'll know how I want it done. And it became very glaringly obvious that you needed a kind of people that believed in what you believed in, that, that were the type of people you wanted, right? Your mission statement tells everybody and tells your team what you're there for to do. Your cultural statement says, what kind of people do we need? So our, our cultural statement is, is we want a connected team of positive solution finders who genuinely care and communicate. And every single one of those words are, are there for a purpose. Um, I've actually done like a little video of each word for our team so that they can see each word. We didn't just put a word in there. Right. And, 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 and so, you know, believe it or not, though, that cultural statement is only about 12 to 18 months old. So yeah. it's not something. So for the first 12, 13 years of our company, I didn't really have a written down cultural statement. I tried to tell people what I wanted. Um, but the, the, what really came out of all of this, this looking at this cultural statement and, and working through what we want our cultural statement to be, is how important having a real culture matters. You know, if you don't have a culture, if people in your company don't know what you want them to be like and the kind of people you want, they're not going to be connected. There's going to be a bunch of random strangers or random people with their own agendas doing a job. You don't want people doing a job. You, you want them rowing the boat with you. You want them working together with you. You want them to believe in what you believe in. Um, and, and so we, we believe that if we put a cultural statement together, we already had most of the people on the bus we wanted. We, they, we knew they were part of that cultural yeah. statement. And, um, and then the second part of that was is realizing that, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you, you have the idea, right? You have the idea of how things can be done better um, or, or things can be done a different way. But eventually, you have to have other people help carry that idea for you. You know, a company of 70 people, I can't, I can't instill the culture with 70 people. There's no way. Uh -huh. And so therein lies my leadership team, right? This, you know, identifying these group of people who I can invest in intentionally, and then they take that and they invest into each of their teams and their departments. And it's so critical as you grow a company and you reach these stages where you realize, okay, I'm not the only one anymore. I've got to trust other people here. Identifying those people that you really know will, will take your vision, take your culture, and, and, and embrace it and then share it with those with them. Man, great stuff. Great stuff. So uh, technology has been a common theme in the conversation, as I've mentioned. And, um, and um, I was curious if you could give us any insight into what the future of technology looks like as it relates to your business. Sure. Um, the, the biggest thing for us that we have recognized, and, and again, with COVID has kind of really highlighted this, is that people want to be able to get their answers when they want them, right? We, we live in a world where, you know, it used to be... Uh, you know, you would have to wait or plan out something. Now it's, you know, if I want food right now, I can just get on a waiter and, and waiter it. Or if I need a ride somewhere, I'm going to get on Uber and Uber it. So it's no different in our industry, right? People, people don't want to sit on the phone on hold. Uh, they, want, they don't want to wait days for an email back. And so what we call it is we call it self-service. Um, people being able to have avenues to go in and find the answers to their questions that they need themselves. Um, one, one example of that that's kind of, over the years has kind of evolved is people making payments. You know, when we first started, people had to mail in a check to us to make their payment, right? And that's just, that's aggravating. And then it got to where, okay, we can set up an auto debit from your, your bank account if you want, um, if, but a lot of people didn't feel comfortable with that. Well, now they can actually go through our software and click a button on their phone and make a payment, right? They don't have to wait to hear from somebody. They don't have to see, check, call and say, what's my balance? What do I owe? they can do it themselves. Uh, or if they want to add a fence to their backyard, instead of having to fill out 40 different form, forms, they can go on the, the website and, and fill it out, and boom, it's submitted, and there it is. So self-service, allowing your customers to do the level of work they want to do on their own is huge. Now, you can't get rid of the human element. You know, we can't, you, you got to have humans there for them to talk to. Sure. Um, but you know, like what I love is, you know, if Amazon, if I have a question, they have a chat feature. I, don't, I, I can chat go do some work, and then I hear a ding, okay, now I can chat back. Right. Those are the kind of things that people want. Right, right, yeah, I can see that. Um, so um, when you look out for the vision of your company moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as a growth potential? Do you have a five-year or a 10-year goal of where you want to be? Sure. Um, I, we don't have goals uh, in terms of growth. Um, and the reason I say that is because I, I talked with you earlier um, 
I trained my mind a long time ago not to set standard like goals of numbers because right. um, I just feel like those hamper you. You know, when we first started, we set a goal of 50 communities right. and, and we blew past that without even looking back. So I don't want to say, you know, 400, 500, 600. Um, my goal is that we're always looking to innovate and to improve. And as long as we're doing that, we're going to be okay. You know, we have a property management division. Uh, we manage individual rentals for, for investors. And we also have a maintenance division. Right. I never envisioned ever having that. Somebody came to me one day. He was, he was doing it on his own, managing his own properties and a few others and said, hey, look, I really love what you're doing at community management. Can, can, can I bring that in, in-house with y'all and we can work on that? Said, well, sure. Yeah, let's do it. And now it's grown to, we manage nearly 300 rentals. Um, we have a maintenance division with five people in it. Um, so things of that nature, if, if you ever just set too strict of goals, you're going to limit yourself to that. And when you hit that goal, what do you do? You know, again, I, I say your, your greatness, your where, you know, where you want to end up should be a journey. It should never be a destination. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but it sounds like you're, you're not planning on dampering your trajectory. Oh, no, any, right? no, no. So um, whether it's expanding across more states, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. more cities, more communities. Yeah, it, I, we're, we're definitely, um, we're growing along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and in Alabama. Um, you know, we've, we've, I don't want to say saturated the market in Baton Rouge, but I mean, we're, we manage a lot of what's in Baton Rouge right now. Right. Um, no, I want to continue growing. I want to continue to look at ways, um, you know, we talked about multifamily at one point. I mean, that's not off the table if we right. ever have that opportunity again. Um, the, the biggest thing is, is just being smart when you grow. Somebody told me that a long time ago, you know, don't, don't get too big before you're ready, you know, hire be- before the need. That's something I learned. Like, don't, don't wait until you have 20 more communities to hire another manager, hire, hire ahead of the need. And so we're always looking at that growth and looking for opportunities, um, to, to expand not only our services in other markets, but what we do in these current markets. So you're what, 15 years in now? Yes. And, um, so I don't know that there's any low hanging fruit for you at this point, as you look to expand services, you've done maintenance and, and single family property management and, you know, multifamily, and you'll probably venture back into that. But do you see any other, uh, service that you may, uh, offer in the near future or work towards? Yeah. I mean, we, we, we talk about some different things every once in a while, but those are really our core areas. Yeah. Um, there's nothing else really that we, you know, our maintenance is kind of our most recent one and yeah. we're still learning on that one and how it goes. Um, you, you know, the, the biggest thing is just continuing to improve upon what we do, um, and making sure that we're, we're the, the best at what we do. Yeah. Um, and always looking to innovate. I, I will say that, you know, just like the company itself and just like the maintenance and the property division, um, sometimes, Sometimes great opportunities fall in your lap. You just got to be paying attention. Yeah. Look, it seems that you're really passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suspect it it really wouldn't matter, as you alluded to earlier, if it was community management or management of HOAs or a mechanic shop or whatever else it is. But it seems like that passion is what's been driving your success and, uh, and then building building your teams in the way that you have. So what advice would you give to one of our listeners or viewers out there who may be harboring this thought about, man, maybe I should, you know, enact that idea and, and go into business, but just hadn't pulled the plug yet. What sure. yeah, What advice would you give that person? You know, the, I think the biggest thing is, is first that you, you if, if you want to be an entrepreneur that creates a business, you got to be somebody who wants to create something. And, and always look to improve upon it. If your mindset is, I got this great idea, I just want to do it and then be done with it, chances are it's, you're, you're going to lose that passion along the way. What, what drives me every day is, is that I know we can do something better or I know there's something better that we can add to what we do. Um, and, and so I never am satisfied. Um, and so to, to have that idea, any entrepreneur can have an idea of like, I think I can improve upon this. But you have to be committed that, Once it gets that, I know I'm going to be looking for it to be better. Um, That's a big thing. The second idea, the second thing that I would say is that you make sure, you know, it's got to make sense to make dollars, 
meaning that, you know, put, put pen to paper and, and, and draw out your plan and what it's going to cost you and how are you actually going to turn that into a money-making thing. Great ideas are great, but if they don't pay the bills, then your chances are it's not going to work. And so that was a big thing for us is planning out those financials and looking at it. So, um, you know, knowing that it's going to take some hard work, right? It's, it's not easy. Um, if it was easy, everybody would do it. That's so cliche, but it's true. Um, and then the last thing I would tell you is, is find the right people. You, yeah. you don't have to be the expert in what you could have a great idea about a, a new app, but you don't know how to work a computer. Well, okay, well, go find, go find a person who buys into your vision and, and bring them on board. Yeah. Find the right people. Good stuff. A lot of harmonisms uh, <laughs> you, 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 uh, shared with us today, which is great. So uh, you had mentioned earlier in the conversation when you were starting and you would you know, get up at 3.30 and work uh, at your side job and then do your real job and then your side job after that. And, and I think most uh, entrepreneurs who have reached 15 years of uh, success have uh, – gone through that path yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how your life work balance has played out over the years. Uh, I know for myself and many people, it's out of balance, at least for a good chunk of time. But uh, can you kind of walk us through how that's worked for you? Sure. Um, it, it definitely has gotten better. Um, it's, it was in, in the beginning, um, you know, starting a company takes a lot of time. Um, if you think it's something that you can just do 30 minutes out of the day and then forget about it. it you're, it's not going to work. I mean, it, it takes a lot of your, your, your time and your passion, partly because of the money part, right? You don't have a lot of money to hire a bunch of people, so right. you are the everything, right? right. Um, and, and so you have to have that mindset, and, and your family has to be on board with it, you know, uh, whether it be a spouse, a partner, your kids even. If you're, you're later in life and you have kids you want to start something, they have to kind of understand and be on board with it. Um, but you have to find time for family, um, I tell my team this all the time, you know, you're, you're not, you're not living to work. You're working to live. Okay. Keep that in mind. Like you're, you're going to work every day to provide a service and to meet this mission for community management. And I love you all for that. And I think it's great. But at the end of the day, you're doing that so you can provide for your family. You can provide for yourself and you can go take trips. You can do other things. Don't forget that. Right. Don't forget that because if all of a sudden all your life comes is about work, then really, what are you doing it for? Like, I mean, what, what, what's, what's the purpose here? And so um, I made sure every morning I brought my kids to school. I brought them home. But there was definitely times where my wife had to handle a lot of the stuff because I was out the office doing this or doing that. And so I, w I would tell you that if, if you have a short-term idea of, you know, okay, well, I'm going to commit this year to, you know, probably not being home, you know, a lot during the week or whatever, you know, that's fine. Just make sure that your, your family has that buy-in with you and that, you know, long-term the goal is, is to, to have more family time because it can be done. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to uh, business owners over the years, some of them who have been in business longer than I have. And, and I would say that they're working a lot because they just want to work a lot. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't have to put in 40, 50, 60 hours a week anymore. I've got a team to help me now with all of that. And so I, I don't think that if you're looking to start a business that you go, well, I can't be away from my family for the next 10 years. Well, you don't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Jeff, it has been a pleasure to talk to you. I love your energy. I love your passion. And it's, uh, it's clear why you have been successful. And uh, I love how you've taken a business that is, it's a tough business yeah. uh, and, you know, making hay out of it and, and finding better ways. I love the, the constant pursuit of improvement. So uh, congratulations thank and you. continued success with all you do. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Great job. Thank you. I just love Jeff's energy and his passion and, this episode is just filled with gems. You know, he talked about the three P's, the process, the product, and the people, but he really had a major focus on his people. And I think when he created his cultural statement 18 months ago, it uh, was very effective, and I think that's going to fuel his growth uh, into the future. Hey, it's funny that he talked about before he started is what he's doing now is a job that you couldn't pay him to do. And now, if you look at the level that he's performing, 
in that industry right now. It's just exceptional. He's talked about uh, business being a journey and, and not a destination. And he's clearly on this journey and clearly enjoying himself. So we wish him continued success. Uh, Jeff can be reached uh, online through his website at cmgt.org. We thank you for watching, and we'll catch you next time. We would like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. They can be found online at b1bank.com. The Next Entrepreneur is produced by Propel Productions. You can find more information at propelyourstory.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Next Entrepreneur podcast and hit the bell for notifications. You can also follow us on social media. The links are in the description below.